Welcome to the Influenza webinar series hosted by the Human Vaccines Project. The Human Vaccines Project is a nonprofit public private partnership with the goal of decoding the human immune system to accelerate the development of vaccines and immunotherapies. In order to make real progress toward the development of a universal influenza vaccine, collaboration among researchers around the world is essential. We hope that this monthly webinar will foster the scientific foundation needed to advance influenza research. This series of webinars will be broadcast on the third Tuesday of each month and posted online. For a copy of today's webinar, please visit the Human Vaccines Project website at www.humanvaccinesproject.org backslash talks. Following the presentation, we will have time for questions from the audience. Please type your questions into the questions box in the GoTo interface. I will read these questions following the presentation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ali Khan. Dr. Khan is a research assistant professor at the Toyota Technological Institute at Chicago, which is a computer science institute located on the campus of the University of Chicago. His research interests are in computer science and immunology with a focus on developing new bioinformatics and machine learning methods to study the molecular and cellular systems that control immune function. In addition to his academic research, Dr. Khan has also worked on applied math and computational biology research in industry, including Merck and Genentech and currently Tempest Labs. Today, Dr. Khan will tell us about connecting single cell gene expression with B cell receptor specificity. Thanks, Julian. Um, so as uh, uh, Julian mentioned, uh, I'm a computer scientist who's uh, interested in immunology, and uh, I'm really thrilled that this uh, cross-disciplinary series has a specific and I think uh, uh, great interest in utilizing bioinformatics and, and machine learning methods to better understand uh, vaccine response uh, and influenza. Uh, so uh, thanks again for the invitation, and, and I'm really excited to kind of share today um, what uh, I think are a series of uh, approaches and techniques that encompass the landscape of uh, computational methods uh, that are useful for uh, influenza research and understanding uh, immune response. Uh, so briefly, I, I also do a lot of uh, industry work, but most of it is unrelated to uh, influenza or vaccine. So I thought I would share uh, three short vignettes. Um, and there's a couple themes that connect these uh, vignettes together. The first is uh, leveraging single cell sequencing technologies. Uh, and then the second uh, theme is uh, principled kind of computational techniques for uh, eliciting out uh, subtle signals from single cell data uh, and improving our understanding of how specific immune processes uh, work. Um, I, what I'll do is I'll first go over um, some current and uh, present computational paradigms for how we look at single cell data. And then I'll uh, move on to the application of uh, some of these techniques for understanding how uh, gene expression can be coupled to receptor specificity. And then I'll end on um, some open problems or, or, or areas that we're working on, which uh, are some new algorithms for modeling uh, B cell function. So single cell biology, uh, it, it's a, a complicated and challenging task uh, uh, from a computational standpoint. So the way we can kind of abstract uh, single cell RNA sequencing uh, in, in a way to think about it computationally is that you begin with uh, on the left-hand side of this diagram with single cells that have been captured. Uh, those individual single cells are then um, uh, prepared and, and uh, sequenced. And mathematically, if we take the top branch of this uh, kind of procedure, we can uh, construct a matrix. And so here the matrix is columns that consist of the different cells that have been captured in a population. So these might be the cells that one captures uh, in a germinal center or these might be cells that have been uh, uh, sorted and uh, selected for specific cell surface markers, such as plasmoblasts. And the rows then are genes uh, that uh, uh, can be, uh, whose expression can be quantified through RNA-seq. And so for, let's say the human genome, you have about 20,000 uh, uh, genes. Uh, 
and uh, some sub subset of those are expressed in various cell types. Uh, and so on, on average, you'll get a few thousand genes that are expressed uh, across a number of cells. With that matrix, there's a few computations uh, one can perform. Uh, one of them is to kind of just assess the uh, population structure of the cells uh, you've captured. And there in computer science, there's a long um, uh, litany and history of uh, visualization techniques. So what we can do is we can take this matrix and project it into, let's say, a two-dimensional space uh, where we can kind of look at how uh, different cell types are clustering. And in areas where we've, uh, um, in, 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 question, in, in problems where we're interested in trying to understand uh, the, the heterogeneity within a population, this is really great to kind of visualize and then interrogate um, what uh, cell types are likely present, uh, what are the transcriptional differences that are uh, driving those clusters apart. Oops. So, uh, oh, sorry. So, so the, and then the last uh, part is we can actually take uh, the uh, uh, low dimensional projection of those single cells, and then we can also infer trajectories, right? So in a germinal center, there'll be affinity maturation, or there's just be uh, uh, other types of uh, maturation processes going on in the immune system. And if we sample from specific niches, or if we sample across a, a series of time points, uh, we can actually then uh, reconstruct how those cells are maturing over time and uh, gain an understanding of how certain transcriptional circuits are driving that uh, maturation process. So that was kind of like the top part of this uh, uh, schematic. On, the, on the, the bottom part of this schematic where we're uh, referring to something called TCR-BCR assembly, one of the, uh, I think, computational questions that had been neglected a bit was with single cell RNA sequencing, while this is a really elegant and, and impressive paradigm for quantifying the expression of genes um, in various cellular conditions, at the end of the day, we're sequencing uh, nucleic acid uh, uh, from these cells. And uh, depending on the protocol, such as SMART-C2, or, or even in the more kind of current um, um, high throughput 10x platforms, one can actually uh, exploit that sequencing information to gain an understanding of what the immune cell uh, receptor sequence is. And so here we, we can unlock a, a, an incredibly powerful um, insight into not only the cell's transcriptional status of what genes are, are expressed and turned on, but we can also gain an understanding of uh, what does the cell recognize. So in, in, in B cells, uh, the, the BCR sequence, and in T cells, of course, uh, the TCR sequence. So we identified these kind of uh, core computational challenges and we published this in a review uh, a couple years ago. And um, today I'm gonna focus on the bottom half, which is um, uh, an algorithmic technique for assembling uh, the B cell receptor sequence. But we, we've gone into details about uh, some of the opportunities and challenges for each one of these tasks um, in the review. So, uh, when we sought out to uh, determine whether one can assemble uh, the B, B cell receptor sequence from single cell RNA sequencing data, there wasn't actually uh, any uh, published uh, work in that area. And uh, it's a challenging problem for, for a couple of reasons. First, uh, single cell RNA sequencing can be a bit noisy. Uh, second, uh, it's, a, it's a challenging task. So the general problem of uh, uh, transcript assembly uh, is, is challenging, but with single cell owing to uh, uh, complexities with uh, coverage of what gets transcribed, uh, this problem hadn't really been approached. So what we thought to do is come up with an efficient uh, and sensitive technique for uh, assembling B cell receptor sequences when we can for uh, from single cell RNA-seq data. And the basic approach is, well, if we look at a, like a kind of a generic diagram of a B cell receptor on the, on, on the left-hand side of this figure, uh, we can I potentially identify regions of the B cell receptor sequence, such as let's say in the heavy chain, that um, typically are not subject to uh, significant uh, uh, genetic changes, such as uh, somatic hypermutation or, or other uh, alterations. And that's an interesting kind of insight because what we can do is we can take a published um, uh, uh, database of known uh, uh, B alleles and constant regions and take the initial data set and try to identify what we call anchor positions. 
So when we perform single cell RNA sequencing, you're going to have a library of uh, 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 sequenced reads of a specific length. And uh, we will try to then align those sequencing reads to our reference data set of variable and, and constant regions and try to identify specific points uh, uh, along uh, those two uh, regions that can serve as anchors. And the intuition here that, that I kind of want to uh, uh, convey is that while we have a good understanding of, let's say, regions that are not subject to genetic alterations, uh, there is certainly a gap in between where it's unclear to us uh, uh, what the sequence might be. There's no specific uh, database of all possible uh, uh, BCR sequences with all uh, possible uh, somatic carpet mutations, obviously. But what we can do is we can begin by identifying uh, what we think is a good anchor uh, uh, position in, let's say, uh, the constant region. And the gradient that I'm trying to show along that transcript is, let's say, some level of um, uh, consistency between uh, a, a given uh, BCR transcript or a heavy chain transcript and uh, what's known in, in databases. And we can try to identify a second anchor position, which uh, also has, shares this kind of uh, concept of um, sequence similarity to um, some known data set. Okay, so this is kind of a, a, a reference-based um, initialization where we're beginning to identify two positions on this transcript uh, that uh, maps well to a pre-existing database. The intuition is then uh, what we want to do is stitch across this. So what we would do is we would grab from our bucket of RNA sequencing reads and try to see if we can extend one of these anchor regions uh, towards the other site. And uh, hopefully, like this, uh, th this has become intuitive, what you want to do then is go back into the RNA sequencing read, and try to extend further and further and further until you're able to actually bridge across. And so the important point to note here and, and why we call this a semi-de novo assembly method is that it's not completely de novo. We are initializing based on kind of our known understanding of, of BCR sequences and the body of, of uh, uh, receptor sequences that have been collected uh, by, by many to articulate, you know, what are the constant regions and what are the, some of the variable regions uh, uh, that are present uh, in, in human populations. So once we're able to kind of bridge and connect these two uh, anchors together, we're able to then um, uh, construct uh, a putative uh, uh, BCR sequence. Computationally, a big challenge here that I won't go into a lot of detail, but I hope to kind of, uh, again, convey how these techniques work, because I, I think at the end of the day, methods matter, and, and it's important for uh, uh, both uh, the, uh, the people who develop methods and the practitioners who, who use these methods to kind of understand what were some of the assumptions uh, involved in, in, in developing these techniques. So one of the things uh, that computationally is kind of uh, challenging is that as you're extending the sequence, so in stage 2b, what we show is the anchor sequence, uh, at a given position or, or point in time in the algorithm, there's a variety of, of ways we could be extending that anchor sequence uh, just because of uh, the uh, 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 non-uniformity of the, the reads that are, are generated from a single cell RNA sequencing day, uh, experiment. And so what we used was an idea from information theory. Uh, basically what we wanna do is minimize our uh, entropy or, or as every time we extend this sequence from one anchor to the other, we want to be very sure, and that's kind of uh, uh, a generic way of saying this, but we want to be very confident about our selection of reads that we use to extend from one anchor to the other. And this um, uh, term of being very sure is predicated on the idea that we want to find scenarios where uh, there are uh, a large number of reads that uh, support uh, the the read that we're that we're intending to choose for extending an anchor, and at the same time, uh, there isn't a lot of noise associated with it. So it's a very clear signal. So what we're showing in kind of that blue um, geometric shape is our selection of that read at the bottom over there um, that has uh, evidence of at least twenty 
other reads that are identical. And any kind of uh, spurious noise is actually quite small relative to the uh, more abundant uh, read. In other scenarios, uh, you might have an equal number of uh, two possibilities. And so what you want to do is you want to always choose the extension that um, is, is most confident uh, from your perspective uh, based on the number of reads uh, that support it and also uh, as an alternative, the, the, the amount of noise that might be in the, in the next best alternative uh, uh, option. Uh, the the thing to to also I think appreciate is that uh, this is a, a fairly simple and straightforward idea in computer science where this is a greedy algorithm. So every time we we make a choice, we're we're choosing uh, the best possible uh, local option. So there are two things that we have to kind of consider. One is that it's not guaranteed to always find uh, the optimal uh, answer, which means that uh, sometimes we're not able to uh, stitch across the two anchor sequences. And uh, uh, that's uh, that's due to some of the um, um, issues with it being a greedy algorithm. Uh, however, we found empirically and in practice that for the vast majority of time, we, we are indeed able to uh, assemble a BCR transcript. And the limiting factors actually just read coverage. So as long as you're able to, let's say with SmartSeq2, get enough read coverage uh, of the BCR transcript, you are able to then successfully assemble uh, the BCR. Uh, in order to kind of demonstrate the uh, quality of this uh, assembly, we compared it to a its current state-of-the-art uh, uh, de novo assembly program called Trinity that was developed at the Brook. And what we found is that there was a 12% improvement over uh, the, the Trinity method. So uh, an example uh, is in this single cell uh, experiment uh, that we did in uh, collaboration with Patrick Wilson's lab at the University of Chicago, where we have a single cell. And when we uh, looked at uh, the assembled sequence, which is that um, uh, uh, second to uh, uh, bottom uh, gray line, we found that it, we were able to successfully reconstruct uh, the, the variable region, including C uh, CDR1, CDR2, and CDR3. However, when we used a fully de novo method that does not use kind of some of the known biology, it falls short of assembling the entire uh, uh, sequence and specifically uh, neglects to assemble the CDR3 region. The way we were able to kind of validate this is that Patrick's lab was able to then perform Sanger sequencing on the DNA. And we were able to then use that as a gold standard for confirming how accurate our uh, assembly method is. And we found that we had um, strikingly less error than uh, typical off the shelf tools such as Trinity. And so uh, over time, because this was the first method for BCR assembly, other authors have also put forward uh, their own BCR assembly techniques. And the good news is that we're actually uh, quite good at, at assembling this. And so uh, overall, uh, this was quite, um, uh, in, in our mind, an important advancement and, and proof of concept that um, sometimes simple methods work very well. And, uh, you know, it can unlock uh, specific and important insights from uh, immune single cell sequencing. At the same time, this method gained a little bit more, uh, as it started to gain a little bit more traction um, in collaboration with Stephen Quake's lab, uh, Derek Crude was able to use our same approach uh, and actually adopt it so that it also assembles TCR sequences. So if you have single cell TCR sequencing, uh, this technique will also assemble, uh, single cell T cell sequencing, this, this method will also assemble uh, TCR sequences. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the tool is, is, is available, uh, it's, it's open source, and it uh, can be easily um, uh, downloaded uh, and used. So the key points uh, for, for this were, uh, we can now access BCR and TCR information from single cell RNA sequencing data. And I think in, the, in this next part, uh, which I hope to uh, persuade you and, and demonstrate, we're, we're poised to now connect this receptor information uh, to specific transcriptional signatures. One thing to note is uh, for, for uh, many people who are adopting, I think, 10x uh, technologies, uh, 10x does have native TCR and BCR assembly for their 5 prime kit. Uh, so BASIC remains quite useful for smart, smart C2 protocols where um, the entire uh, uh, 
transcript is is being sequenced. Uh, and and there is some reason to think that um, uh, the uh, the depth of sequencing for a smart seq two uh, in some situations might be more useful for answering a specific question than the uh, the breadth of cells uh, one can obtain from tenex. Um, and then just in terms of kind of where we're hoping to go in the future with this algorithmic work, we're actually thinking of adopting this technique now uh, for efficient and fast assembly uh, to bulk RNA-seq data. So if one was to perform uh, bulk RNA sequencing on uh, uh, B cells or, or, or some other compartment, uh, we'd like to be able to uh, just use that RNA-seq data and uh, assemble estimates of uh, 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 heavy chain and light chain. Of course, it'll be uncoupled, but uh, it, it may still be quite useful to to get a sense of uh, the repertoire of, of the heavy chain and light chain uh, from a bullet perspective and um, circumvent the need for doing amplicon sequencing, uh, amplicon based uh, 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 receptor sequencing. So next, what I'll do is I'll try to um, share some work uh, we've done in in collaboration with Patrick Wilson's lab at University of Chicago on connecting single cell expression to uh, BCR specificity. So uh, this was work uh, uh, with with Patrick that we, uh, we just published uh, earlier this year, um, and it was done by uh, a few uh, very talented uh, PhD students in his lab, um, in particular, uh, Carlin Nu, um, who, who had worked on this for uh, quite some time. So we were interested in, in, in uh, characterizing and understanding um, receptor antigen reactivity and clonal how receptor antigen reactivity and clonal origin may alter uh, gene expression profiles uh, in plasma plus. And so the the, the general uh, paradigm was um, after uh, after uh, flu vaccination uh, seven days after flu vaccination uh, IgA and IgG plasma plus were isolated and subjected to single cell RNA sequencing. And uh, owing to uh, uh, Patrick's expertise in, in this area, uh, his lab was able to actually uh, uh, determine which uh, cells could recognize uh, flu. And so that allowed uh, uh, Carlin and, and, and everyone in, in the group to be able to bin all the single cells in this experiment into three categories. So uh, IgG vaccine positive, um, so Ig uh, secreting cells that could uh, recognize influenza, IgA vaccine positive, so for IgA, and then IgA vaccine negative. So as we started on this journey, and, and I know that we're all kind of, uh, it's a sophisticated audience here, but it, I think it is important to kind of uh, remember one thing, which is when working with uh, large single cell data sets, often um, as it uh, is uh, in, in human studies, there are some batch effects. And so one of the things we noticed quite immediately was if we took the, uh, the single cell RNA sequencing data and we were to kind of uh, do this low dimensional projection that I uh, uh, mentioned earlier uh, and we um, saw a clustering, uh, we could find that the cells were actually clustering quite nicely by, by experimental batch. And so in the upper left hand corner is the initial data set and, and PW, um, uh, refers to, let's say, experimental batch. We found that all the cells were actually clustering primarily by batch. Uh, and the uh, uh, upper right-hand corner is, is a different experimental designation. But the, 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 the primary thing that I'd like to draw everyone's attention to is, is the graph on the upper left-hand side, where the clustering is very clearly delineated by uh, experimental batch. So one of the first things we actually needed to do was uh, uh, do batch correction. And so after batch normalization, where we're uh, using a linear method to adjust for the expression so that it no longer is um, uh, associated with the experimental batch, we felt a lot more confident and comfortable uh, proceeding with the analysis. And so after batch normalization, you see uh, the transformation that occurs in the bottom left-hand corner, which um, will show that all the different experimental batches are, are intermixed. And specifically, as you, meant, uh, as you may have uh, uh, as you may remember, these were all uh, specific plasma plus cells that had been um, sorted and selected. So this population, um, uh, so, so the same uh, population was selected from each of those, uh, each of the individuals that uh, uh, comprise uh, across these batches. And so the, the other thing to also note is that, um, you know, uh, making sure to also do careful experimental design. So if you are going to 
um, utilize different batches, it's often uh, useful to include samples across two batches to help facilitate normalization, which is what occurred in this case. Um, one of the things we did uh, uh, straight out of the gate was we applied BASIC uh, to these uh, cells. And here, what we were interested in doing is seeing whether the uh, repertoire information we were able to glean from a single cell, uh, whether or not it matched information uh, that has been previously known by Patrick and others at the population level using uh, receptor sequencing. And so one thing that we found is that um, uh, 10 to 20 percent of the clones that we identified uh, in the single cell uh, have both uh, IgA and, uh, and IgG isotypes. Uh, and so this was, and that's been previously uh, uh, seen, and uh, or that, that's also seen in, in, in uh, population level uh, 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 receptor sequencing. And so this was a nice kind of um, uh, orthogonal kind of validation of the fact that uh, BCR was able to uh, resolve, uh, or basically was able to resolve BCR sequences, and also uh, the results were consistent with other um, orthogonal uh, techniques. So one of the first questions we wanted to answer was, um, because now we can um, uh, assemble the, 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 the B cell receptor sequence of these individual cells, uh, we're able to determine whether it's um, uh, uh, the clonal structure of all the cells. Um, do B cells from the same clonal family have more similar transcriptional profiles than unrelated B cells? And so initially when we uh, sought to answer this, uh, what we thought is we would um, uh, do a clustering or do a projection of all the single cell data, uh, mark the cells that had um, uh, uh, that shared a clone. And so in the upper left-hand corner, we've numerically marked um, uh, uh, cells uh, that are from the same clonal family. Uh, one of the things though that we noticed immediately was that uh, the single cell data was actually strongly stratified by uh, the receptor isotype. And so if you look in the upper right-hand corner, uh, that same single cell data um, shows uh, a strong association with simply whether or not uh, the cell was expressing IgA or IgG. And so uh, in the upper right-hand corner, the black and the blue are all the cells that are expressing uh, IgA. And what you'll notice is that uh, the black and the blue largely cluster together. And uh, when we um, look at IgG, it, it clusters slightly apart. However, what we're also able to do then is um, bioinformatically remove uh, any immunoglobulin genes. So uh, isotype uh, variable region, uh, B, uh, sorry, B alleles, and uh, ask this question now in a, a completely um, uh, uh, structured way of saying, uh, without Ig genes, uh, do, do cells that uh, are within the same, clone, cells within the same clonal family, are, are the, the transcriptional profiles more similarly correlated than non-clones? And what we found is indeed that to be the case. It's a subtle but significant, uh, 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 significantly uh, important uh, point where cells within the same clonal family are uh, more correlated than uh, uh, non-clonal cells. And if you look then in uh, the lower right-hand corner, this is kind of a revised uh, uh, projection, and it slightly differs from uh, the, the plots above because we've removed the immunoglobulin genes. So this should kind of result in a slightly different projection of the data. And what you see still is uh, uh, many scenarios where uh, uh, cells from the same uh, clonal family to roughly uh, correlate in the same kind of neighborhood and geographies. So overall, although BCR transcripts contribute to transcriptional similarity between clonal plasmablasts, the expression of non-IG transcripts within a clonal family are also similar. The second question uh, was, uh, we, we wondered whether, uh, are there significant transcriptional differences between vaccine positive IgA and IgG plasmablasts? So here we were looking to see whether there's any uh, transcriptional difference between um, uh, plasma blasts that differ only by uh, uh, isotype of their antibodies. And so um, uh, similar to kind of that earlier observation, when you look at just 
uh, the cells uh, that are vaccine positive, you see an immediate stratification between um, uh, IgA expressing cells and uh, IgG uh, uh, expressing cells. And so in the uh, left-hand corner, um, this is again like a T-SNAE plot uh, of uh, all the vaccine positive cells. We can do a uh, volcano plot, which is we can say, okay, let's actually compare what are some of the significant differences between the IgG and IgA. Uh, and perhaps not um, surprisingly, we found it was largely just the immunoglobulin genes that were different. So then we redid this exercise by removing all the IgG genes. And what you see then is actually uh, a uh, loss of any kind of uh, uh, distinct clustering based on isotype. And so this uh, suggests to us that uh, besides the BCR genes themselves, uh, peripheral blood and IgG or IgA plasmoblasts induced by influenza vaccine have highly similar uh, transcriptional profiles. The last question that I think uh, uh, we were able to approach because we could combine uh, the, the, re the receptor information and, and the expression data was, uh, we asked whether uh, there are significant transcriptional differences between vaccine positive and vaccine negative IgA plasma blasts. And so here uh, in the upper left-hand corner, we're showing again a dimensionality uh, uh, reduction plot of uh, just the IgA uh, plasma blasts. And here in blue are the IgA vaccine positive cells, and in black are the IgA vaccine negative cells. Um, what we find when we do a volcano plot or when we look for significant differences between those two populations are uh, many number of genes, uh, uh, besides actually uh, immunoglobulin genes. And in particular, uh, two very interesting genes, uh, FOOT8 and uh, V4 uh, GALT1. When we uh, remove IG genes, we still see that um, uh, the uh, key transcriptional or there are there are transcriptional differences between IgA vac vaccine negative and IgA vaccine positive. So it's, it's not just driven by um, the expression of Ig genes, um, as it was seen uh, quite clearly with uh, uh, Ig versus uh, IgG. Foot eight and uh, before uh, Galt one have been implicated in glycosylation, and so there have been uh, previous work and, and comments on how uh, glycosylation plays a role in. Um, uh, influenza specific antibodies. And so uh, uh, previous work has uh, suggested influenza specific antibodies um, can shift from a pre vaccine glycan profile towards a distinct glycan profile um, that may regulate uh, overall immune response. So uh, we found that there are significant transcriptional differences between vaccine positive and vaccine negative IJ plasma blasts, including genes associated with like, glycosylation of antibodies. Um, however, whether this um, differential expression of glycosylation associated genes are related to uh, the generation of, uh, of plasma blasts or um, uh, perhaps conversion of memory cells to plasma blasts, it's, it's uncertain. Uh, but, the, but the expression, their differential expression um, seems to be uh, regulated in uh, an antigen specific uh, manner. So I think the key points to kind of summarize here are the fact that with single cell RNA sequencing and um, uh, key computational approaches, you're able to actually take a multimodal view of uh, immune cells uh, in uh, an important context, uh, such as post-vaccination. You can use a single cell data um, to look at uh, the heterogeneity of the, of the cellular population. Uh, you can use the sequencing information from those single cells to uh, obtain a view about the clonal structure of those B cells. And you can actually integrate that then together to um, identify uh, important patterns and, and couplings and associations between uh, receptor specificity uh, and gene expression. Um, and so the, to the best of my knowledge, this, this is perhaps the first work to kind of uh, integratively develop these techniques and apply it uh, to the specific uh, uh, paradigm. And we're excited to see um, 
further and future applications of, of this integrative uh, approach. So what I thought I would uh, uh, then uh, kind of uh, uh, bring to, to front our uh, new algorithmic techniques uh, that we're interested in in developing and utilizing for studying uh, B cell function. So I thought I would break this into kind of two parts. First is in understanding, uh, I think there's a, there's a distinct and key uh, uh, computational uh, opportunity and challenge in understanding uh, how uh, gene expression changes over time in these uh, immunological processes. And uh, I thought I would also then uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, questions that we're interested in as it relates to uh, how to think about uh, the space of these receptor sequences. So in regards to the first point about understanding gene expression over time, there's some collaborative work we've been doing with uh, Harinder Singh, uh, who's now at the University of Pittsburgh. And so what we've been interested in is using our um, uh, computational techniques for, for analyzing uh, single cell data, uh, assembling the receptor sequence, for understanding how uh, B cells behave, let's say, during class switch uh, uh, recombination or, or affinity maturation. So here's a quick schematic of some data that um, it's, it's unpublished, but, but, but it's uh, stuff that we're working on in collaboration with Windows Group, where we can see um, a, across a population of cells uh, going from uh, IG, IgM to um, IgG, uh, the expression uh, decrease of IgM and the increase of the um, uh, switched isotype. And then we can try to find patterns that are associated with this uh, transition. And so some key computational challenges that still remain to be solved that, that we're working on includes uh, identifying other patterns in a principled way. So um, certainly, as one would expect, um, AID starts increasing as uh, you get closer to uh, completing uh, isotype switching or class switch. And uh, interestingly, it, it decreases once that, that's accomplished. But we like to find other um, uh, transcriptional programs associated with these processes in different ways. Uh, in experiments that, of course, uh, involve multiple time points, uh, multiple batches, this can be quite uh, complex. Uh, and so developing new techniques to kind of study this uh, more precisely are, are going to be very important. So uh, I would propose that one open problem for the field uh, is still uh, coming up with uh, effective uh, techniques for integrating multiple data sets to resolve temporal changes with gene expression. And I think what will be very exciting is, is kind of um, approaching for the first time uh, our ability to track expressional changes to uh, during very important uh, uh, B cell processes such as affinity maturation. The second uh, kind of area that I wanted to touch base on that I think uh, might be very interesting for the community to think about in terms of uh, advances in computation include uh, works in understanding uh, the structural basis and, and interaction of uh, the antibodies. So uh, some of you may be familiar with, of course, uh, some landmark uh, work that was presented um, at an annual meeting uh, called uh, the Critical Assessment of Techniques for Protein Structural Prediction. So this was actually machine learning work that was performed by a group at Google uh, called DeepMind. And uh, what they showed here, uh, really remarkably is um, in, in blue, uh, their pre predicted structure of a protein that they predicted from the primary amino acid sequence. And in green was the actual resolved uh, structure of the protein as let's say through crystallography. And what's incredibly exciting is that they were able to uh, learn on large sets of data, the orientation and, and general structure of these large molecules. And so just given the primary amino acid sequence, uh, they were able to predict that structure in blue, which um, remarkably uh, corresponds to what um, that protein actually looks like um, uh, uh, in, in a cell. So with colleagues um, at the uh, Technological Institute, we've been also interested in studying uh, protein structure and molecular interactions. 
And so in the last year, we've been working on techniques to model protein-protein interactions. And I'm starting here because uh, this will lead to, uh, so I guess spoiler alert, this will lead to the, the, the question that we're particularly interested in, which is how do we start modeling uh, antibody interaction with antigens? Uh, so if you have uh, 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 sequences that recognize just the stock region, of influenza or, or, or the head, we'd like to be able to know what sequence properties and what kind of uh, uh, techniques are there for now representing representing and modeling sequences that uh, 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 discriminatively are associated with different uh, parts of the virus. And or even more simply, whether or not they are likely to interact uh, with flu. So uh, in, in the earlier work, uh, Patrick's lab had to rely on ELISA to kind of predict whether uh, a cell was uh, vaccine positive or vaccine negative. Uh, I think it'd be great if, if we're able to develop computational techniques where after a single cell RNA ex experiment, we can point out uh, distinctly which cells are likely to um, react to flu versus which ones uh, are not. So here, just as a kind of a general overview of how we've, we've gone about uh, modeling the molecular interaction between two different proteins, and, and you know, this, this can be generalized to uh, uh, antibody and, and antigen. Uh, we, we take, so starting from the left-hand side of this diagram, we, we, we begin with um, two protein molecules as elucidated or, or defined by their primary amino acid sequence. We find a way to represent those sequences in a specific uh, uh, kind of high-dimensional way, what we call as a sequence profile. And so here we're basically um, encoding that alphabet of amino acid sequence to a, a matrix that can represent it um, uh, in, a, in a more complex fashion. And we take those uh, matrices, we use uh, neural networks, uh, a specific kind of, of, of kind of neural operations called convolutional uh, neural networks to combine that uh, and to combine and integrate information about that sequence in, in a variety of different ways. And we take that integrative then representation of those sequences and we learn a model to help uh, identify whether or not those two sequences will interact. And what we found is that this actually works well. So we, we trained and tested this on a large number of protein-protein uh, interactions. And so we're actually quite excited and, and, and hopeful to um, uh, begin uh, approaching this question now for, uh, for flu and, and other uh, immunologically relevant uh, uh, problems. So uh, computationally, I think uh, we can kind of uh, uh, present this as uh, a, a series of, 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 potential, of exciting computational tasks. So beginning with antibody sequences, there's several prediction tasks we could uh, try to approach, including predicting uh, flu strain, whether um, the antibody is uh, stock reactive or head reactive. Um, more recent uh, uh, computational work has uh, resulted in the ability to actually go backwards and try to learn what parts of the antibodies or even what parts of the uh, 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 target molecule or, or partner in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in, in the protein-protein interaction context uh, are important for uh, predicting, uh, let's say, uh, the, the strain of flu or, or, or other um, uh, interactions. And so what that allows you to do is actually then develop a, a roadmap for saying, okay, if these are the positions that are quite salient for me to be able to predict a stock reactive or, or head reactive or, or associated with one uh, strain or another, uh, what happens if we were to then uh, alter the amino acid in either the structure of the, of, uh, the virus or if we altered uh, uh, the, the amino acid in the antibody? Would it lead to uh, a, a, a better uh, binder or would it actually uh, uh, disrupt uh, any pre-existing interactions? Uh, so uh, overall, when it comes to computational biology and, and machine learning, I think this is an incredibly exciting time. I think uh, novel computational and machine learning methods are really needed. Uh, uh, to advance our understanding of uh, vaccine response and influenza. Uh, and I think this is a really uh, exciting time for, for computer scientists, but also for the broader interdisciplinary community 
um, single cell uh, technologies, uh, large uh, data sets and machine learning. It, I think it represents an important confluence of uh, different capabilities that really promise us to unlock uh, new immunological insights. Uh, so I'd like to kind of uh, uh, end there and, and uh, thank uh, um, some students who have worked with me at, at Toyota Technological Institute, uh, Chun Ming Tang. Uh, he did a lot of the uh, wonderful early work in, in modeling uh, uh, single cell data and low dimensional representation, some of the algorithmic work that went behind uh, BASIC. Uh, he's going to be moving to uh, Amazon, uh, so uh, we're losing a really good computational immunologist. Uh, but uh, um, uh, if if their students or trainees or, or postdocs are interested in working at this intersection, I'd love to chat. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, collaboration with with Patrick has been really uh, special as a, as a computer scientist. Uh, it's been fantastic working with him, uh, given uh, shared interests. Uh, part of the work that we uh, that I presented involving uh, uh, connecting. Uh, uh, BCR specificity with single cell expression and clonality that was done with also in collaboration with, with Sarah Kobe's lab at, at University of Chicago. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to take uh, any questions and, and go over um, uh, any of the earlier points. I should also apologize, I'm, I'm kind of remote right now. Uh, so if there was stuff that um, I need to repeat or, or, or show again, I'm happy to do that as well. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Khan. That was really interesting. Um, at this point, if you'd like to ask a question, please just type it into your question box and I'll read it aloud. And um, Ali, while we're waiting for people to type in questions, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the protein-protein interaction modeling for predicting flu strain. I just thought that sounded really interesting and we'll like to hear a little bit more about it. I think you might be on mute, Dr. Khan. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. So this this work began actually with um, us thinking about given two sets of sequence information. So uh, in, in this case, antibodies and let's say um, uh, sequences known to be associated with certain uh, strains uh, versus others. How do we actually represent these sequences in a machine learning uh, paradigm? Uh, and there was some work actually that we began uh, playing around with uh, from David Baker's group, uh, where they were looking at small, uh, not antibodies, but small peptide inhibitors of, of different uh, flu strains. And some of those uh, peptides uh, differentially uh, bound to uh, uh, different uh, strains of influenza. And so we were interested in, in seeing if we could uh, model that uh, um, high throughput data by taking the sequence information and finding ways of, of, of predicting whether or not those peptides would, would interact with uh, a given uh, flu strain. So the, the, the computational part, uh, I think we, we have a good, idea or I, I won't say handle until we're able to kind of empirically prove it but the next part is now um, actually mining through public data sets uh, with, with collaborators getting these types of um, antibody uh, uh, and, and strain associated information and and seeing whether or not we can find uh, uh, highly accurate uh, classification results got it thank you um, and it looks like at this point, there are no other questions. Sometimes those come through late, so I'll be happy to email you them if there are any that come in later. Um, and I just wanna thank you again.